More on the life and times of the late uh, former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. We're now joined by Professor John Strimlau, a visiting professor of international relations at Wits University. Very good evening to you, Professor. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, just speaking of air, you actually uh, just mentioned to me a couple of moments ago that you knew Mr. Kofi Annan very, very well. Take us through your relationship with that. Well, it, it, it would be an exaggeration to say we were close friends, but we were neighbors back in the 1980s in New York City when he came as head of administration at the UN. And over the years, I've seen him many times, most recently in 2014, I think, at the Carter Center. And I came to admire him enormously for his diplomatic skill, but also for his personal touch. Uh, I have plenty of anecdotes, if you'd like to hear one or two of, yeah, <laughs> of sure. my past experience with him. Well, you know, the limits of diplomacy are very real. And uh, one of the things that I admired him most for was that in 1997, he went to Harare to the OAU summit, and he spoke about the importance of democracy and human rights. In many ways, it was a precursor to what Thabo Mbeki did with the African Renaissance and the African Union, playing up more the importance of human rights. So I said to him in 2014, you know, you did that speech in Harare, it was historic, and many of the African leaders said only a son of Africa could have gotten away telling us that uh, we, we, we should take upon ourselves the universality of human rights and not um, be hesitant about condemning unconstitutional changes of government and all that. And I said, you know, here, President Mugabe is still in power. How did you reconcile that? And he smiled and he said, well, you know, John, I saw President Mugabe three or four years ago. I went to Harare and I said, President Mugabe, you've done such service to your country. Don't you think it's time to bid farewell to your people? And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, my people aren't going anywhere, <laughs> which basically indicated that he knew very, very well the limits of diplomacy. Yeah. And because he came through the UN system, he knew that the UN could not do um, everything that he would like to see it do and you alluded to some of that in your earlier segments about the controversies around oil for peace and other things um, uh, Rwanda and the genocide there were limits because it's a UN is owned by governments and he knew that very well yeah you know at, at one point um, he was very bold about his critique of the US and, and Iraq war, the Iran war that was taking place. And he got huge um, hit back and challenge uh, from the US as well as its, its military allies. How, as the man that you knew him, did he then take those challenges? Well, the man had great integrity uh, and honesty, uh, but he was an operator in the bureaucracy and he knew governments had to be dealt with in a forthright manner. He was a creature of the U.S. desire to see Boutris Ghali removed from the Secretary Generalship after a term and was championed by the U.S. And during the Bosnian War, he managed to um, work the U.N. in a much more effective way in support of the peace process which the U.S. championed. Then you come to Iraq where he opposed going in there, the second Iraq War, not the first one, the Gulf War. He came in after that, but the, but the second one, um, he, he felt that there could have been, been more of an effort to get Saddam Hussein to uh, be more accommodating under the sanctions regime than the U.S. and George W. Bush, the son, were willing to do. So he called it like he was, and by that time he just took the criticism and went on with it. Mm -hmm. And no one really could touch him in that regard. On the continent, earlier you also alluded to uh, describing him as a son of the soil and saying that he was a people's person and that he always applied a personal touch. Uh, just take us through the influence um, and the facilitation of, of peace that he's had on the African continent. Well, you know, any peace process has many fathers and, and mothers. And so that you would be interesting to watch Kofi Annan not claim too much credit. Uh, he always said that this is an institutional achievement. This is an achievement of many of who have worked so hard within the staff. One of the great attributes he had and why he was so popular in the UN system was that he came through it so that he knew the various avenues of trying to get the UN to be more effective. And so when he initiated um, peace processes or work so hard and oftentimes in a frustrating way in Sudan, you alluded to the Darfur crisis earlier, um, you know, he couldn't get what he wanted, but he would push as hard as he could to get the UN as 
much involved as possible. And I saw that particularly with regard to the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, although he, he, he was on his way out of the Secretary Generalship after um, that peace process in 06 started to, to, to go because his term was coming to an end. Let's talk about some of the initiatives that he held close to his heart. Uh, case in point being uh, the one about the, the global fight against HIV and AIDS, specifically during his, his tenure as well as post-tenure, and also calling on af other African governments to, to heed that call and to fight actively against it. Well, you see that, um, in, in certainly in the regime of Thabo Mbeki, would not have been so popular, and yet it was, in fact, important for the Secretary General, uh, who is not, after all, um, directly involved in health programs, although the World Health Organization is very important and under him. However, he did champion the fact that we ought to be more uh, engaged in helping prevent as well as mitigate the effects of HIV AIDS and I just can't resist one other point on this he was a man who believed in preventing conflict not so much re re resolving them many of the issues that he dealt with he dealt with quietly and you wouldn't see on the record because bad things didn't happen uh, on his watch but that will take historians to track down, and, and, and I can't claim to know the inside story to all of that. But I talked to him at length during the course of the, course of the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict, which he took a personal interest in. I was on the staff of that organization at the time. And I realized how much he desperately wanted to see the UN be a preventive agent, not a resolution agent, you see. Not, after, not being called in after the conflict got so bad that no one else could deal with it, but try to get that preventative diplomacy working forward. And that, I think, is one of his most uh, important achievements uh, that, that is not recognized, really, because you don't see it. Yeah, take us through his workmanship and how essentially he led. In reading up uh, one of the stories specifically uh, to one of the, the, the crises that took place in Darfur in, in South Sudan at the time, where he actually wanted to go to the ground. He wanted to see the trauma. He wanted to see how the thousands that were fleeing, that were displaced, how they lived and, and what some of their challenges were. Describe to us you know, the way that he worked. In, in understanding that, in wanting to make his way to the ground? Well, ag again, I wouldn't presume too much because I was not involved in the Darfur crisis directly, although uh, the Carter Center played a great role in initiating the, the, the peace process, and, and, and Annan was very much involved as a friend of th that process. But what you're pointing to was the desire, although he was a man of great refinement and, and a almost aristocracy, Ghanaian Ashanti aristocracy, his, his birth sort of like Madiba yeah. here, uh, and yet he had a common touch. Uh, for a bureaucrat at the UN, that's uh, quite a compliment. And he wanted to be able to be able to say, I have seen, I have felt, I, I have saying. experienced, I have empathy. And, and again, that is not uh, a typical uh, diplomat's forte. He's, of course, he was a father, had kids, he was a husband, he was a statesman, a respectable leader. How will Kofi Annan be remembered? Well, he'll be remembered uh, appropriately as, as, as perhaps the greatest secretary general. He was the seventh, and certainly the first from Africa and the first from within the system. And I think, as your earlier pieces mentioned, that uh, he will stand very well in the, in, the, in the annals of history of the United Nations. What sort of leadership qualities can um, other statements, as well as the leaders currently within the, the UN system, take from him? Well, they can take the good example that he set for them all of restraint and recognizing the limits as well as the possibilities. You can only deal in the UN with the governments who own and pay the dues that run the intergovernmental organization. If we ever get to a point where we have a world government, then we might take a different view of the possibilities of what would be uh, a good leader. But within the UN system, you can only deal with the hand you're dealt. In terms of you know, the tributes that have poured in, as well as uh, the, the global leaders that have uh, said this, or had their say rather on Kofi Annan, the contribution that he's made, whether it's in their country or whether it's through his processes, how do you receive that? Well, I think they're all perfectly justified. I can't resist noting that we also had a terrible loss in the last uh, 48 hours of Aretha Franklin. Aretha Franklin talked to the soul, the heart and soul of humanity. Kofi Annan talked to the head, to the, to the reason to the, that we should be able to work our way through problems, whereas Aretha, bless her heart, spoke to the soul.
Definitely. We thank you very much for your time this evening. Uh, joining us in studio, that was Professor John Streblau, a visiting professor of international relations at Wits University on the late former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, also uh, sharing with us some of his personal experiences that he had with Mr. Kofi Annan in working with him, as well as also uh, describing the man that was, as well as his leadership qualities and his compassion. You can continue to send us your...